We have the energy, ability, and courage somewhere inside of all of us to do what has to be done. Hello everyone, great to see you here. I'm uh, Greg Dalton, host of Climate One here at the Commonwealth Club. I'm so happy to see you. That Thank you all for, for joining us. Um, delighted to see you here for a conversation with Peter Glick, uh, host of, on Three Ages of Water. And very exciting taking the stage here for the first time in San Francisco is my co-host, Ariana Brocious. So I'm really excited about that. We're in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I'd like to acknowledge the Ohlone and other indigenous people who have stewarded these unceded lands for 10,000 years. Currently, there are many tribes and bands working together to restore their culture, heal from uh, tra trauma, and protect their traditional territory. I recently started talking with members of the Coast Miwok Council where I live and have learned a lot from them and encourage you to go beyond these land acknowledgments and meet people and reach out to indigenous people in your community. They are still here. We're recording today's conversation for the Climate One radio show and podcast that drops every Friday. You can subscribe wherever you get your pods. We record here about once a month on this stage. I'm excited that on uh, uh, July 17th, J.B. Straubel, co-founder of Tesla, who's been tinkering with electric cars as he was a young man, um, is now CEO of Redwood Materials, an exciting company that's trying working on recycling lithium ion batteries, real, batteries, really interesting company. You can register for this and other Climate One events on our new refreshed website, climateone.org. We can create playlists and share them with people. Before I welcome Ariana and Peter, I'd like to encourage you to, to uh, support us here at Climate One. You know, we need your help. Audiences are not what they used to be. Downtown San Francisco, we've been affected. And you, by this UR, uh, QR code, you can scan that now or later and make a five or a 10 or $20, you know, one time or monthly donation to support our fabulous team uh, that creates this fabulous content that's our audience has grown from about 20,000 a week to more than 170,000 a week in the last, last few years. Uh, at the end of this evening's conversation, we'll take questions from you in the, here in our live audience. If you're on the live stream, you can put them in the comments section. If you're here, there's a question card on your seat. Please write your name and your concise question. And then Megan will uh, collect them, our producer, and then we'll invite you to come to the microphone. I think it's going to be over here in the name. Uh, Ariana will call people to come up in that order, and you can read your, your question. And... Uh, I founded Climate One 17 years ago. I went to the Arctic, I got scared, I came back, I cried, changed my life, been doing this every week for 17 years. And we now have a newer uh, expanded team. If you've been listening to the podcast, you've heard Ariana and me more and more, so, uh, which is great, it's better now. There's a reason why that audience is growing because we have a talented team and Ariana's a big part of that. So now for the first time, I'm really excited to have her on this stage conduct an interview with Dr. Peter Glick, co-founder of the Pacific Institute and author of The Three Ages of Water, Prehistoric Past, Imperiled Present, and A Hope for the Future. Please welcome Ariana and Peter. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Peter. Looking Thank you. forward to this conversation with you. Your new book divides humans' relationship with water into three ages. In the first one, humans lived and died in relation to water, to their access to water and threats from water. Major events like floods became part of our cultural and religious stories. And as humanity progressed, so did our ability to control water through dams, canals, irrigation. So much so that today, we mostly consider ourselves insulated against oversupply or shortage. And yet, every year, we see examples of how fragile this control really is, especially in our climate amplified world. So how well do you think we're currently managing our relationship with water? Well, let me start first of all by, by thanking you and Greg for, for having me here. Uh, it's wonderful to be at, at Climate One again. And also this is very three-dimensional, um, something I'm, I think I'm not that used to for the <laughs> last few years. Uh, the, the short answer is terribly. We're, we're not managing our relationship with water well at all. Uh, there are all sorts of climate and water-related crises. Um, we take water for granted. 
Uh, and uh, the history of water tells us that we could and should be doing better than we're doing now. And there are examples in the past of, of doing better, would you say? Well, there's certainly examples in the past of doing better. We, we, can, we can talk about the, the current ones. Um, but in the first age of water, this sort of prehistory, it didn't matter as much. Populations of the planet were very small. Uh, we took water where we found it and we dumped our wastes where, where we could. And it did, again, it didn't really matter. Life was pretty miserable anyway and b brutal and short. Um, but those early, that early era of water really helped define humanity. It helped sort of set the stage for, for where we are today. And today, and I think this has actually been true for, for quite a long time, about 80% of the water we use goes to grow food. And yet cities are growing, our populations are growing, we need more and more water. We've seen major advances in irrigation technology, but I would say fewer shifts to less water consumptive crops, especially in states like my home state, Arizona, where cotton and alfalfa are still mainstay crops. How can we maintain our agricultural economies and food production while using a little bit less water or a lot less water? Well, this is a key, of course. Uh, as you say, 80% of the water that humans use worldwide goes to grow food. Uh, that's partly a result of the green revolution that happened in the last century, where we learned really the importance of irrigated water for agriculture. And in fact, 80% of the water that we use in California goes to grow to grow food as well. It's, it's the same as the world numbers. And uh, populations continue to grow. There's a food crisis as well as a water crisis. Hundreds of millions of people go to, go to bed hungry every day today. And populations continue to grow. And the, part of the question is, how are we going to continue to grow enough food with the water supplies that are already overtapped? Mm -hmm. uh, we already use more water than I think is sustainably uh, possible worldwide, and yet populations continue to grow. And so one of the key questions really is, how can we do more with the water we're already using? How can we grow more food? How can we meet our needs with less water? And are there gonna be, I mean, do you think that there's um, a receptive audience for some of these changes in the US? I mean, just speaking to the US and the amount of power the agricultural lobby has, uh, there's a lot of water that is that goes to grow things that we don't eat, you know, it goes to grow food for cows or food for other animals. Um, is there a way to, I mean, do you see a future where that changes, where we take some of that water for other uses? Well, it depends on who you mean by a receptive audience. Uh, there are lots of different audiences out there. Uh, in general, people really care about water. If you look at public opinion polls about the environment that have, have gone back for many, many decades, uh, water, access to safe water and the availability of water and protecting the quality of our water has always been right at the top of those public opinion polls. People care about water. Uh, and in terms of changing the, the way we do what we do, uh, it depends on who we're asking to change and, and what the benefits are. We already see farmers growing more food with less water. Uh, when there's a shortage of water, there's pressure on water resources then farmers think, well, what can I do differently? How can I do what I want with less water? So we see that in California, we see that around the world. Uh, there are changes in irrigation practices now that are moving us in the, direct, in the right direction. But laws and water rights and institutions are sometimes very hard to change and sometimes very slow to change. Yeah. Well, staying with agriculture for just a couple more minutes because it uses a lot of water. We have already seen stretches of U.S. farmland go out of production because wells have gone dry, groundwater wells. Um, or in here in California, you know, the pumping has gotten either too expensive or it's, and also led to ground subsidence. What are going to happen, what will happen to these regions when it just becomes impossible to pump any more water? I mean, will, will they recover? Will we see them recover? So this is, again, where history sort of is interesting uh, to me. In the first age of in the first age of water, we didn't think about irrigation. We we grew crops once agriculture was invented, where water was reliable, where there was reliable rain, where there were reliable rivers. 
uh, in ancient Mesopotamia, in the Indus Valley, in India, uh, in China. But as populations grew and as we outgrew those local water resources, we had to think differently about where to get our water. And today, a vast amount of our agricultural water comes from groundwater, mm -hmm. uh, something that was not possible a long time ago, uh, and that really resulted from the Green Revolution. Today, uh, a lot of the crops that we grow are grown with what I describe as non-renewable groundwater. That is, we pump groundwater faster than nature recharges it. And like oil, when you pump something faster than nature recharges it, the stocks go down, it becomes harder and harder to find it, it becomes more expensive to use it, and in the long run, it's not sustainable. And that's the agricultural crisis today. A, a substantial amount, maybe 30 or 40 percent of the world's food production comes from non-renewable groundwater and it simply can't continue. Groundwater levels are dropping. It's happening in California, it's happening in the Great Plains, mm -hmm. northern China, India. We have to think about how to replace that water, how to grow more food with, with less water. That's, again, part of the challenge. One of the really interesting things I learned from your book is that groundwater pumped from aquifers eventually ends up in the oceans and actually contributes to sea level rise. And this, I don't know, you think about what you're talking about, you know, this larger point of water being, the, the supply is continuous, is constant, but we just kind of move it around. And in a way, we've moved so much of it around in this uh, maybe second age of water that we've really changed the dynamics. And so can you tell us a bit more about that? Because I thought that was, that was news to me. Yeah, that's right. So th there are actually two, there are lots of kinds of water, but, but there's renewable water resources, the rivers that flow, the rain that falls, the hydrologic cycle that we all remember from elementary school. Um, and there's non-renewable water, the groundwater resources that have been laid down over thousands or tens of thousands of years, and there are stock there, but that when you use them, get used up. Uh, when we use groundwater and take groundwater out of that stock and put it on crops, it goes back to evaporation, or it runs off back to the oceans. Strangely enough, it contributes a little bit to sea level rise because you're moving a stock from underground into the renewable hydrologic cycle. You know, we think about sea level rise and of course the tremendous impact of climate change on, on sea level rise, but there's a little additional increment of sea level rise that's happening because we're moving water from this stock underground back into the active part of the hydrologic cycle. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, well, so this second age of water is what you define as our current age, and this has been defined by advances of, in engineering that have essentially replumbed the entire planet and brought along unintended consequences, pollution, ecological disruption, conflict, climate change, and then a term that you, you use, water poverty. Can you define that for us and, and tell us how that's impacting women and girls around the world especially? So water poverty is, what I mean by that is simply uh, the failure today to provide everyone on the planet with safe water and sanitation and the inequities we see in the way our water systems and institutions have been developed. Um, the second age of water was, a, was really an age when we discovered what water was. We discovered what oxygen was and hydrogen and the molecule that, that makes up water. Uh, it was the scientific revolutions that helped us build the water systems that we have today, that let us build aqueducts not a few kilometers long out of dirt, as we did in ancient times, but hundreds or thousands of kilometers long and through mountains and build the huge dams that provide water and flood control and drought protection and hydropower. Um, and the smart systems that help deliver to us safe water and sanitation, the things most of us take for granted. You know, the idea that, that we can turn our tap and have incredibly cheap, incredibly pure water delivered to us is something much, many of us in the sort of richer part of the world take for granted. But there are billions of people today worldwide that don't have access to safe water and sanitation. And that's really what I define as, as water poverty. And even in the U.S., as you said, where tap water is al almost always safe to drink, we have underinvested in our public water supplies, so much so that um, 
though we need, to repair, we need to repair and replace most of our infrastructure in the next 15 years, and we don't have really the, the funds to do it. Has that changed with the infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act and the infusion of money that we've seen from those? It, it has, to some degree. Um, that's another important part about water poverty. You know, we take it for granted that those of us in the wealthier part of the world have safe water and sanitation. Uh, but that's true only as long as we invest in our water systems. And the disaster in Flint, Michigan a few years ago, where a good water system went bad because of underinvestment and mismanagement, and the disaster today in Jackson, Mississippi, and the communities in the Central Valley that don't have access to safe water still, uh, and the Native American communities that have never had access to safe water in this country. It's not, water poverty is not just uh, a problem in the developing world, it's a problem here. And part of it is the failure to provide safe water and sanitation to those communities, but part of it is, as you say, the, the failure to continue to invest in the water systems that we have. Uh, we're not adequately investing in upgrading and maintaining our urban water systems in most places. Uh, that leads to things like Flint, Michigan, and Jackson, the failure in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, and, uh, passed by Congress and signed by President Biden, provides a lot of money for water, provides a lot of money for all sorts of infrastructure in the US, which is great. Uh, it provides $15 billion, for example, to remove lead pipes. We, we, we still have lead pipes in our cities in the United States, which, which is uh, an embarrassment and a, and a travesty in many ways, but it provides money for that. Uh, it provides money for uh, investing in new water systems and upgrading water systems. So it is a step forward. A lot of that money ought to come from our own pockets. You know, we, we pay water bills. That, that water goes to our water utilities. Those water utilities are responsible for maintaining and upgrading our urban systems, um, but they haven't been maintained the way they ought to be. Well, this is one thing you also write about in the book, this uh, sort of necessity that you argue to continue investing in our public water supplies as opposed to privatizing them. And maybe the, can you kind of explain that argument and maybe the problems that might come from privatization of water? Yeah, I do talk in the book about the trends toward water privatization. Uh, and that can be defined in a lot of different ways. Bottled water is a, a way to privatize public water systems as well. And I talk about bottled water in the book too. Uh, but there was a trend of, uh, a number of years ago, a more, little more than a decade ago, there was this belief that because of the challenges we face with our public water utilities, that maybe private companies could do a better job. Uh, and this was true in the United States and it was true worldwide. Uh, in the US, most of our public water agency, or most of our water utilities are public and they've always been public. A small fraction, maybe 15% are, are private. But there was this belief that because of problems with public water agencies, that maybe we should turn them over to private entities. And the World Bank was arguing in developing countries, we should let private companies run water agencies because public agencies and governments have been a failure. Um, so that was a bit of a trend. There was a lot of opposition at the time. There were riots in Cochabamba, Bolivia about an effort to privatize the water system in Bolivia, and people died in those riots. Uh, and at the same time, there were a number of public water agencies that saw the threat of privatization and realized that one way they could maintain public control was to improve their operations. Mm -hmm. And it turns out a well-run public water agency is just as good as a well-run private water agency, and rates tend to be lower for public water agencies, and the profits which go to a private water company don't tend to leave the community. And if you maintain a public water agency, uh, those, those, there are no profits, really. Those, mo those monies are reinvested in the public system. And so there is still pressure in some places to privatize water systems, um, but I think the lesson that we've learned is that a well-run public agency is a better idea. So we talk on Climate One about the individual and the systemic and ways people can have agency and try to um, you know, work for climate agency in their own lives. And I'm curious if there's a water intersection here. I mean, as a water utility member, as somebody who pays water bills, is there something you can do to kind of keep your 
uh, utility working for you? I mean... Well, yes, in fact, you know, most water utilities are sort of a mystery to most people. They, they, again, they turn on their tap and they get clean water and they pay their water bill. Uh, and there's not a problem until there's a problem. But public water utilities are public. They have boards of directors and members of the public run, can run for boards of directors. And people can go to can go to meetings at their public water utilities or their private water utilities, and they can participate. Uh, there is agency here. Pe people, because people care about water, uh, it, it's always better not to wait until there's a crisis to get involved, but people can get involved, and, and there are things that every one of us can do uh, to pay more attention to what's happening in our own backyards. You mentioned um, tribes as being one of the groups that doesn't always have great access to water. And in the Southwest, particularly, tribes hold some of the oldest water rights. And they've also been ignored in discussions of water management, like on the Colorado River, and left without access to clean, plentiful water. I think the Biden administration has been working to address some of these wrongs. And I'm curious if you think we've seen any significant changes yet, or maybe some that are to come with these new investments, for tribes specifically. Well, this is a total... Uh total contradiction in terms, in many ways. Water rights in the West uh, have been given out under something called prior appropriations, first in time, first in right. If you were there first, you were the first farmer to take water out of a river, you had a higher, a more senior water right than somebody who came along later. And that first in time, first in right rule it defines water rights in the Western United States, and yet the tribes who really were here first, obviously, tend not to have senior water rights. They were excluded from those early water rights allocations. There has been an effort in recent years to, to change that. Uh, there have been court cases in recent years that have reallocated some rights back to the tribes. Uh, this is true on the Colorado River. It's true somewhat in California, but not, not as much as it ought to be. Um, and it is an opportunity to regret, to address and, and reverse some of the wrongs that were done over the last couple of centuries in the West. Uh, but a lot more needs to be done in that area. The, the Biden administration has worked on that. Uh, there's been a lot of work, especially, again, as I said, on the Colorado. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I think is uh, common in the popular imagination when you think of water is water wars, right? And in the book, you write that so-called water wars are um, improbable, unlikely, and historically rare, but violence and armed conflicts associated with water are unambiguously and dramatically on the rise. So can you unpack that for us? Sure. So in the first age of water, this sort of the earliest years, the early empires, we actually see the first water war, something I would actually describe and do describe as a water war, uh, 2400 BC, 4,500, almost 4,500 years ago, uh, a conflict over access to water and irrigation systems in ancient Mesopotamia, in ancient Sumeria. Uh, and the history since then, uh, again, this is something I've worked on for a long time at the Pacific Institute. We maintain something called the Water Conflict Chronology, which is an open source database of conflicts over water throughout history, uh, shows us that we don't have wars over water. Wars start for a lot of reasons. Wars start for economic reasons, ideological, religious, political, conflicts over borders, economic reasons. Um, but we do increasingly see violence associated with water resources in three forms. Uh, we see water as a trigger of conflict where there's a dispute over access or control of water. Uh, we see water or water systems used as weapons during wars, again, wars that start for other reasons, and we see uh, water as a casualty or water systems as casualties uh, of conflicts, again, conflicts that may start for other reasons. And we recently did an analysis of the data in the water conflict chronology and data in history that shows that the number of conflicts over water have increased very dramatically in recent years, in part because of growing pressure over scarce water resources, in part because of a number of conflicts where civilian water systems have been targeted. Uh, but that's, that's the way I think about water and conflict, not, not as a water war per se, 
but is growing violence and conflicts over, over water. And how do we get around that? Is that part of the idea of just ensuring everyone has access to water? I mean, it could still be a casualty of war, I suppose. Well, there are lots of ways around it. Um, uh, part of the challenge is meeting basic human needs for water. Uh, if everyone has access to safe water and sanitation, uh, if everyone has control of water resources in their communities, there's less likely to be, uh, tr water is less likely to trigger violence and conflict. And we see a lot of conflicts now where there's disputes over control and access to water. Um, international law plays a role in this. International humanitarian law is very explicit saying that civilian infrastructure should be protected during conflicts, including very explicitly water resources. Uh, and so international law has a role to play. Um, institutions have a role to play, better institutions to manage water when it crosses a border. And most rivers worldwide cross borders. Turns out that almost every major international river that you can think of actually crosses a border. Even the Colorado River is shared between the US and Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and so institutions that can manage transboundary water resources uh, are an important part of that puzzle as well. Well, speaking of the Colorado, climate, drought, and population growth have cut the Colorado River's flows by about one third in recent years and dropped its reservoirs to historic lows. Recently, after months of negotiations, California, Arizona, and Nevada agreed to, lo to take um, cuts equivalent to about 13% of their part of the river. And they did that rather than having the federal government step in and decide those for them. Those are significant cuts that should temporarily spare Western cities and farms from having their taps run dry, but it is a short-term solution only. So as a Californian, what's your view on this deal and the longer-term outlook for this essential water supply? So the Colorado River is a great river. It's a great story. There's just so much. There's history. There's politics. There's environmental issues. There's transboundary issues. It, it's it's um, it's an iconic river, of course, because of the Grand Canyon, uh, and so many of the issues that I talk about in the book are are manifest in in what we see in the Colorado River. It's shared by seven states. Uh, the uh, impacts of climate change are already obvious, as you mentioned, on the Colorado. We've seen decreases in flows. Um, I don't think that the agreement that was, that was reached uh, with, uh, about a month ago, I guess, really, is going to be sufficient to address the problems on the Colorado. Uh, as, as you say, I think it might result in a short term, a uh, little bit of breathing space. Uh, but. The problem really, like much of the water in the Western United States, like much of the water in rivers around the world, is simply overallocated. We use more water than nature can reliably provide. Until we get water demand under control, uh, there's not much that, that you can do to reduce the conflicts on the Colorado. We simply demand more water than nature provides. And so by reductions of demand, I mean, we've already dropped our water use dramatically from what it used to be. I know you can cite a figure probably better than I can on that, but uh, we still have farther to go, basically, or get people to move back east instead of out west. So we haven't cut demand on the Colorado that much. Um, and, the, and the cuts that we've seen on the Colorado are temporary. They're in response to this short, the shortages that we see. But I think... Most of the traditional, most traditional water politics assumes, oh, these shortfalls are temporary. We'll figure out how to find more supply. Uh, the climate will change again, and, and we'll get wet years on the Colorado. We had sort of a wet year this year on the Colorado, and the reservoir levels are going to go up a little bit. I think that's temporary. Um, or we'll build a pipeline from the Mississippi River, <laughs> or we'll desalinate water in the in the Gulf of California and pump it up to the Colorado River. Uh, there's this old, old style thinking that will solve our water problems with the approaches that we used in the 20th century and in what I describe as the second age of water in the book. And I don't think that's going to be enough. And then how do we get demand under control? Well, there are lots of ways. Um, 
One is, as we've talked about a little bit, we use water more efficiently. We, we use better irrigation systems. We use better technologies in our, in our industry and our commercial and residential water use to cut our water, water use, to do the things we want to do more effectively. And that's really important, and we've done a lot in that area, and it's cut our water demand a great deal. But ultimately, in the Colorado, and I think in parts of California, um, we're going to have to change what we grow and where we grow it. On the Colorado, 80% of the water also goes to agriculture. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of that water goes to grow crops that are fed to animals to produce meat. Uh, again, this is, this is true worldwide as well. A lot of the food that we grow never is consumed by humans, but goes to feed animals. Um, there's going to have to be a fundamental change in uh, people's diets, uh, in what we choose to grow and where we choose to grow it. I, ultimately, I think land is going to come out of production in the Colorado River. Right, meaning not be farmed anymore. I think we're going to have to cut how much land is irrigated, not just what we grow, but how much land is irrigated in the Colorado. And I think that's going to be true in parts of California. So to that point, about $1.2 billion from the Inflation Reduction Act is going to be used to pay cities, tribes, and farmers to temporarily use less water. But that money will run out, and the water needs will continue. I mean, in some places, I, you're saying we can fallow the land and not use it anymore. Do you think that will... Uh, when are we going to get to that point where farmers are going to willingly be bought out uh, so that we can use the water for other things? Yeah, this is a, a really good point. Um, the agreement that was reached a few a, a month ago or so uh, to reduce water use in California and Arizona and Nevada, the southern basin states on the Colorado, uh, was in part encouraged by a big contribution from the federal government, $1.2 billion. I've been arguing that that money ought to go to permanent reductions on the Colorado, not temporary cuts to meet shortfalls over the next couple of years, but to invest in better irrigation systems, permanent improvements in irrigation systems or urban water use, to buy out farmers permanently. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's going to happen yet, but ultimately something is going to happen to get farmers to cut their, their water use, either voluntarily or by mandatory reductions imposed by the states. And I know that there are many parts of your book that don't deal with water shortage, but because of where we are, there's a lot of discussion around this. Arizona is just announced it's going to stop developers from building some new sub subdivisions around Phoenix because the state has determined there is not enough groundwater to support it. Phoenix has been booming, especially some of these metro areas um, kind of on the outskirts. There is still a lot of development happening, but this is kind of the first step, it would seem, in recognizing maybe that there is actually a limit. Do you agree? Do you think we're going to see more of that? Yeah, so one of the, one of the challenges I just discuss in the book is the failure uh, to think about water resources and economic development in a su sustainable fashion is the best way I can describe it. We've always assumed that we could develop wherever we wanted and whatever we wanted, and ultimately we would figure out how to provide the water and the energy and the food. Uh, it didn't matter where we developed, we'd find the resources. That's simply not true any longer. It's, it hasn't been true for a long time in the southwestern part of the United States and in parts of, of California. Uh, we're running up against absolute limits to how much water is available to us. And the decision, finally, perhaps one could say, uh, to, to think about long-term land use planning and development in the context of how much water is available is a step forward. It's a difficult one. Developers have, have driven this for years. Mm -hmm. um, but the realization now that we, we ought to think about how much water is available and how much energy is available and how much food is available before we decide what to build and where to build it is, is a step forward. Uh, it's, a, it's a radical step forward. Yeah. So pivoting just a bit, the recent Supreme Court ruling in Sackett versus EPA dramatically limited the scope of the Clean Water Act, removing about half of the nation's wetlands from protection from contamination. 
That there kind of sums up the result. That's really significant. What do you think the impact is going to be uh, from this on our freshwater resources? And what, if any, remedies do we have to, to sort of fill in the gap? Uh, so I am an optimist. Um, the the thir third age of water, which I, maybe we'll talk about, is an optimistic view of the future. Uh, I believe we can solve our water problems. That's not to say, say there won't be steps backwards. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the recent decision by the Supreme Court to strip protections from a vast number of wetlands in the United States is a, a step backwards, a terrible step backwards. Uh, that ruling, I'm not a lawyer, but I, would, I will go so far as to say it wasn't justified by the law, it's not justified by ethics, it's not justified by any aspect of environmental science. Um, it was a step backwards. Uh, I can't help but hope and think that in the long run, protections for wetlands will be reestablished uh, we have a growing understanding of the incredible importance of ecosystems for our own well-being, uh, the incredible importance of wetlands for fisheries, for water quality, for migratory birds, for every aspect of, of the environment. Um, but there will be steps backwards on this, this path that I hope will lead us forward. Not to drill down on this, but as a water expert, isn't it just confounding that there's this sort of like n disconnect between the science of understanding that groundwater and surface water are connected and a ruling that sort of says they aren't or that it doesn't, it's not significant enough to matter? Yes, it was a, it was, scientifically it was a completely illogical, ridiculous decision, but the decision wasn't made on the basis of science is maybe the politest thing I can say about that. Okay. Um, I, I, as, a, <laughs> as a scientist, I, I would like to think that our policies, um, our politics, our economics would be based on fact. Um, they aren't always, and, and that's a sad reflection on where we are today. It's partly why the second age of water has a series of water crises. Um, you know, the failure to provide safe water and sanitation isn't because we don't know how to provide safe water and sanitation. It's because of a failure of economics and politics and institutions. Uh, the failure to clean up our water resources isn't because we don't know the importance or how to do so, but because of the failure of politics and economics and our institutions. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go into the third age of water, which is your vision for uh, a more hopeful future. And as a step hopefully toward that, in 2010, the UN General Assembly formally recognized the human right to water and sanitation. In the last decade, what progress has been made on this goal to ensure all humans have an access, have a right to clean, safe water? So the failure to provide safe water and sanitation to everyone isn't a, it's not a new problem. It's, it's not an unknown problem. In 2000, uh, the UN declared something called the Millennium Development Goals. They set a series of goals for the year 2015, a whole series of goals around the environment, including one for water, which was at the time to reduce by half the proportion of people worldwide that didn't have access to safe water and sanitation by the year 2015. And a lot of progress was made in part to try and meet the Millennium Development Goals, but those goals weren't adequately met. Um, in 2015, the UN announced a whole series of new goals called the Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. And again, there's a water goal, SDG 6. The objective then was to meet 100% of the unmet need for water and sanitation. Um, not half the world's population, but everyone. The goal was to meet safe water and sanitation for everyone. And again, a tremendous amount of money and effort is going into to meeting those targets. Um, I don't think we'll meet them, but we are making progress. Uh, a lot of money, a lot of effort is being put into providing safe water and sanitation for everyone. The UN declared a human right to water in 2010, as you said, that, that helped. It's a declaration that doesn't by itself provide anybody with sure. safe water and sanitation. But it, it, was a, it, was a, it was an indication of the growing awareness that water poverty was a problem and that we needed to do more to meet those objectives. 
Uh, but even here in the United States, you know, we haven't met that need for everyone here in the U.S. Um, California declared a human right to water also and passed some legislation to do so. Again, it's a statement uh, rather than any, anything else. But there have been efforts since then to try and increase the amount of money available. $200 million has been set aside to try and meet safe water uh, for populations in the Central Valley of California that don't have it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are making progress, and I'm optimistic that in the long run, maybe not by 2030, but in the long run, we will provide everyone on the planet with safe water and sanitation. I, I, I'd like to think that it's inevitable. So at the end of the book, you paint uh, two possible futures and one is sort of dystopian, and one is very, in my mind, very utopian, um, very optimistic about how we've sort of solved a lot of these problems. But, well, so I want to invite you first to explain your proposal for the soft path of water and what that would mean. So just to be explicit, um, I think we're at, a, we're at a turning point in history, actually, around water and many other things. Uh, the dystopian future, which I don't describe in my book, but which is the possible future, which is the one we hear about a lot in daily newspapers <laughs> and in, in the movies that we see and, and in the story, science fiction stories about dystopian futures, that's, that's the common future that we all understand as possible. But what I describe in the third age of water is not that future, it's the alternative future. Uh, it's the positive vision that I think is not just possible, but also, uh, I think, inevitable. Um, and I think it's inevitable because I see all around me success stories. I see the declaration of the human right to water. I see farmers growing more food with less water. I see urban water use going down in the United States, not going up, even though economy, our economy and our population continues to grow. I see the success stories, the things that we need to do, what I ultimately describe as the soft path for water in the book. And the soft path basically says, we can rethink water supply, which used to mean taking more water out of groundwater and out of our rivers and over pumping our, our, our wetlands and our ecosystems. Uh, and we can find new sources of supply that don't require doing that. Highly treated wastewater, mm -hmm. which we're starting to use in California and that they use extensively in Singapore and Israel and other places. Uh, that we can ultimately desalinate if we address the environmental and economic costs of desalination, that there are sources of supply that are different. So rethink supply is one. Rethink demand. Again, the assumption that we can grow forever and meet demands, growing demands for water uh, is no longer valid, but that we can use water more efficiently. That's demand management and water use efficiency. And again, we use less water for everything in the United States today than we used 40 years ago. We are changing the demand for water. And the soft path says, stop ignoring ecosystems. Again, in the second age of water, we didn't understand or we didn't know the consequences of our water use for the natural environment. But we do today, and we can no longer ignore natural ecosystems, and we're starting to restore natural ecosystems, and we're guaranteeing river flows, and we're taking down the most damaging dams. And so the soft path says, think about ecosystems, not just economics. And the soft path says, rethink our institutions. We need institutions for the 21st century, not institutions that we built in the 19th century and the 20th century that didn't understand the way we need to rethink the way we use water. And all of those together are the soft path for water, and those things together are what give me hope that we can reach that sustainable future. Well, as we close here, I just want to share um, a little bit of my water connection. So I'm from Tucson, Arizona, and our river that flows through town uh, is the Santa Cruz River, one of them, and that's where Tucson was founded. I mean, way before there were Spanish um, conquistadors that came through, that was the site of indigenous people that lived there for, for, I think it's one of the oldest continuously cultivated parts of the whole United States. 
And in the 80s, the river still flowed, and people would go swimming in it. And there are stories of people have you know big high floods, monsoon floods, and it coming up over the banks. And my entire life, that river has been dry. I mean, we call it a river, but it's just an empty, dry riverbed. Um, and a few years ago, the local water utility began putting highly treated wastewater back to recharge the groundwater table there. And it has created this little oasis that's really beautiful. And there is a multi-use path along the river. There's a lot of people that now use it increasingly for walking and biking. There are dragonfly populations. There are frogs. There are birds that come. Um, and it's really a short stretch of river. It's not long. But it's really amazing to have water back in this place where it should have been um, if we hadn't overpumped. So I say all of that to ask you, is there a place like that that you can think of that's special to you and that you've maybe seen go through changes and you're still optimistic about? So that's a, one, that's a wonderful story. And, it, and it's an indication, first of all, about how much people care about water. And it's an indication that we can restore some of the damages that we did in the second age of water, which is our age. Um, that, that's a great story. And there are lots of stories like that. Um, um, my wife and I love, we're, bird, we're both bird watchers. Uh, we love in the winter in California to go up to Northern California to the, the uh, wildlife refuge where literally hundreds of thousands and millions of birds winter. They come down from, from the Arctic and from Canada and they spend the winter in California. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are plenty of other birds that leave California and go south. Uh, but they're incredibly dependent on the wetlands in Northern California that for years have been dried up. The wetlands have been shrinking, the rivers have been shrinking, the fa farmland has paved over a lot of the, the wetlands there. But in recent years, we've seen a restoration of some of those wetlands. Again, this is an example where farmers are, are starting to work with the environmental community. And now, in the winter, many of the farmers in the northern part of the Central Valley flood their lands in the winter, uh, which actually is beneficial for the, the farmland themselves, but it restores wildlife and wetland habitat for migrating birds. Uh, and it's just wonderful in the winter now to go up and see thousands and thousands of acres of, of wetlands being restored and millions and millions of birds. And it, it's just, it's, uh, it's good for the soul and it's good, good, good to know that we're moving along this path. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Peter, for this wonderful conversation. We have some questions from the audience and many more than we actually have time for, uh, a testament to this wonderful conversation with Peter. Um, so I would like to ask Kat Urbis, Nikki Norman, and Peter... Yolis, Yolis, I apologize if I mispronounced that, to please come up to this mic over here in that order. Um, and we'll have you ask your questions. At least one of those is a plant. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of desalination of ocean water for residential and commercial use in California? So uh, there's a chapter in the book about desalination. We know how to desalinate water to take, to take salt out of water. 97% uh, of the water on the planet is salt water, too salty to drink and grow top crops, but, but we do know how to desalinate. And in fact, the history of desalination goes back to Aristotle. There's, there's all sorts of great history in the book about that. It's very expensive. It's the most expensive option available to us. It's much more expensive today than smart conservation and efficiency. It's much more expensive today than highly treated, recovering wastewater, treating that wastewater to an incredibly high standard and reusing it. Uh, but there are places on the planet where a lot of conservation and efficiency has been done already, where they're recycling and reusing water, uh, and where desalination uh, is the source of last resort, and where you, they're using it. So. Um, my short answer is use it when and where it's appropriate, uh, and it provides uh, a source of last resort. Thank you. Um, my question was to give you a chance to say a little bit more about water rights. In particular, how are they different in different places uh, besides the first come, first serve approach? And how could they be changed for the better in the West? 
Uh, so I mentioned this a little bit, but um, water rights are a big part of our challenge in the third age of water. Uh, the second age of water, which I describe as our age, is sort of when we built the institutions that allocate the water resources that we have. And in the Western US, it was this first in time, first in right, that has allocated uh, vast amounts of our water to the agricultural community because they were uh, here first in time, except, of course, for Native American communities, as we, as we talked about. Um, reforming water rights in the West well, I should say, in other parts of the world, water rights are quite different. In the East and in Europe, water rights are riparian rights. If you're alongside a river, you have the right to use that water, so long as you don't harm another person downstream. And there are different kinds of water rights in different parts of the world. But reforming water rights is really important, and one of the biggest challenges, certainly in the West, but elsewhere as well, in part because of politics. It's hard to change water rights. Um, Interestingly, we've given away five times more water in paper water rights in California than there ever will be actual water. So the water rights system, everybody knows the water rights system doesn't work very well. One of the challenges is really going, that we've not tackled yet in California will be reforming, and in the West in general, will be reforming water rights. Um, I think ultimately we may get there, but we're not there yet. My question is, uh, how can we find a better balance between human use and nature's needs to support biodiversity? And in your lessons from the first age, should we look to indigenous science and reincorporate that into the future? Uh, another great question. Um, part of the advance of the second age of water that's leading in my book, in my argument to this third age, positive third age, is we do now understand the importance of ecosystems. Uh, we understand that our health, human health, is dependent on healthy ecosystems. Um, and you know, that started, it started in the 60s, really, when the Cuyahoga River caught fire and we passed the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Endangered Species Act, the fundament, some of the fundamental federal laws that permit us now to protect our water resources. And then the uh, Wild and Scenic River Act laws that are preserving some of the remaining undamaged rivers in the United States and in California. Um, but we still have a lot to learn from lessons from indigenous communities, from the first age of water, from uh, other communities around the world about how to protect ecosystems. Uh, we're learning about how to not just take down dams, but to restore fisheries, and how to protect fisheries. Uh, there are a lot of lessons that we still can learn from other communities, not just here in the United States, from other parts of the world as well, uh, that I think will, will help us restore the natural ecosystem values that are so important to us. Another point about that, though, is rethinking economics. Uh, again, in the second age of water, the value of water was what you could put it to, the, the economic value you could get out of it. You could take water out of a river and you could grow something with it. You could take water out of a river and you could make industrial goods and services and semiconductors and sell those for a lot of money. And we didn't understand the value of ecosystems, but there is a whole new field of economics now called ecological economics. Uh, again, that I, I talk about a little bit, uh, in which we're trying to understand the economic value of ecological values. Uh, and we're trying to change the way we run our economic system to incorporate those ecological values in an economic system that in the past never valued them. Uh, and we're getting better and better at that as well. But again, uh, we need a lot more progress in that area. Well, thank you. Peter Glick is co-founder of the Pacific Institute and author of The Three Ages of Water, Prehistoric Past, Imperiled Present, and A Hope for the, Pu and a Hope for the Future. Peter, thank you so much for joining us on Climate One. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>